It's data, data, and data. <laughs> there is no such thing as artificial intelligence if you don't have good data to train it. Okay? So training data for artificial intelligence is absolutely critical. Talent, or human capital, is one of Saudi Arabia's sort of major strategic initiatives that falls under um, every aspect of what the nation's doing, um, particularly also under the Vision 2030 program. The country is looking at activities from schools, kindergarten to year 12, um, employing and driving AI education programs through all of those. Universities are transforming. We have AI degrees at bachelor and master's level coming through and being accredited by the government in terms of standardization. Um, we have global online courses being translated into Arabic and made available universally to um, anybody in the kingdom. We've also got training programs outside of the traditional education arena into business. So how do we train the AI practitioners? How do we train general employees in organizations? How do we train management and executives in, in, um, in companies? So they understand what AI is um, and what it can do. On top of the training programs, there are boot camps, there are hackathons. Um, Saudi just finished its first ever AI Olympics. Um, and there's a program which is being um, run um, by the Saudi government and Google in alignment uh, together. Uh, kicked off last year, it's called Elevate, and it's looking to train 25,000 women in artificial intelligence and how to use it in their jobs moving forward. One of the most critical things for people to be aware of and think about when they look at artificial intelligence is they shouldn't think about it as the Terminator robot. They should think about it as R2-D2, cute little robot who's gonna help you and make your day better. Everything has changed for hundreds of years. We've talked about the fourth industrial revolution. Okay? We've gone through all those different stages of changing of automation, of the internet and computers. The speculation of what the fifth industrial revolution is going to be is rife. Google it, okay, and you'll get 50 different explanations of what people think it's gonna be or what it's gonna contain. Right? But we know it's coming. And every one of these different industrial revolutions has changed what people do. The people who were employed before each one haven't become totally unemployed. They've retrained, they've reskilled, they've restructured what they do and things. We need to look at universal training and understanding for everybody. There isn't a single person who shouldn't understand what AI is and how it works. And that's something that Saudi is looking at at a major level in terms of what they're doing. Then it's about training people to become AI practitioners. Okay, so if you are going to move out of your day role, how do you actually learn how to code in Python, how to build an LLM or build off an LLM, uh, and move to that development environment or the data management environments required around it? And finally, citizen developers is something we looked at years ago on the internet um, which was development program side with WYSIWYG, drag and drop. The fact you can drag and drop and build a PowerPoint, okay, you don't actually have to code that PowerPoint, that is a very, very simple view of well, what if we can get AI to do the same? We're already seeing multiple large language models that are coming out that enable people to um, code and build their own co um, code in AI. At a really simple level, in a previous role of mine with a major global bank, we had citizen developers who were able to effectively automate their day job. They could go in and go in by dragging different boxes, putting different rules and decisions, hit go, and suddenly their job became easier. That's what we want to get people to understand and think about as AI. This isn't just about people building these massive programs. It's something that anyone has access to, anybody can use, and it's available whenever you need it. It's easy. It's data, data, and data. <laughs> there is no such thing as artificial intelligence if you don't have good data to train it. So training data for artificial intelligence is absolutely critical. You have to have data governance. You've got to understand where your data is. You've got to understand whether you have the legal right to use it, what the compliance is. You can't just go and download data from the internet to run some training models and expect that to be licensable and usable in your systems. On top of data, the next thing that really changes whether organizations 
adopt or fail or succeed or fail is the changes in their operational processes. AI isn't something you just plug into what you do today. AI should be changing the entire end-to-end -end process of how you do something today. We should be going back to the core problem we've got, looking at how AI can, how AI can support it, and the entire new business process. There's an, uh, a phrase in the United Kingdom which is called um, tarmacking the cow path. For the, if anyone doesn't understand that one, it when you tarmac, okay, building a road with tarmac, okay, or metal roads, and the cow path is that um, is the path the cow takes through the field because it's the easiest path to take. So there's no point in upgrading the cow path with putting some AI inside it. You need to look at where you are at A, where you want to go at B, understand what AI will do in the middle, and then redesign that process for it. If you build AI and you don't run a pilot with a team that's invested in changing how they do things, it will fail every time. Thirdly, it's infrastructure. Okay. When you start deploying AI at scale, you need GPU, you need the technology capabilities to deal with it, from streaming data to the processing. The benefit most of us have is AI is backwards when it comes to software engineering, that you normally use a really, really um, small environment to build your software and a really, really big and powerful production environment to run it. AI is the other way around. You need a huge environment to train the model, and then you can deploy it to relatively small environments to run in production. The region is evolving its use of cloud. We're seeing take-up specifically in the UAE. We're seeing Saudi Arabia getting its first adoption of GCP happening this year. Hopefully you're gonna get Microsoft coming in later in the year. It's going to transform the way organizations can use AI because buying GPU, Nvidia or whoever else, is hard, it's expensive, and the waiting list is longer than you could possibly imagine for those GPUs. So getting onto cloud, having hybrid environments is key for thinking how we're gonna do that. And designing that model up front is really gonna help you. The last thing when it comes to succeeding in AI is that you don't always succeed with AI in a business. AI fails. We hypothesize about a solution based on a business problem. We look at data we might have to solve it, and sometimes we don't have the data. Sometimes we have the data, but we can't get the mathematical model to work to actually predict the outcomes at the accuracy rate we want. So don't expect it to, fail, to be successful and to deploy into production with everything you do. You've got to assume there's a level of test and learn in all aspects of AI development across the organization. There's a huge amount of attention on regulation of AI right now. It's one of the hottest topics people are talking about apart from generative AI. Um, what that means is there's almost too much of it. Um, it currently seems to be the thing everyone has to do is come up with an AI governance policy. So we have organizations like NIST, like ISO, um, like the Institute of Responsible AI, like the Open Data Institute, we have government organizations and entities. Everyone is, uh, and then we have quasi-government entities or just sort of macro-government entities like UNESCO, the United Nations, and the G20, all coming up with ways of doing this. But they're not talking to each other. They don't link. I'm in the middle of implementing a ISO, um, AI standard at a government entity. It doesn't link in to some of the other items we've got. It doesn't align into everything. So we have to come together in what we, what we look at. Saudi is doing a huge amount of activity in the space. When you look at regulating AI, you can break it down into a couple of different areas. Okay? The first area is law. What can we actually do from a legal perspective and force people to do things or not? Okay? From a Saudi perspective, that isn't there yet. There hasn't been the desire to put a specific regulation or law in place that requires certification, such as India is talking about at the moment, a proactive certification of AI. The next one is market. Market is all about price. So how do, you, how do you, um, or governments and organizations put VAT and charges and costs 
on things that make it prohibitive for to people to use AI or deploy AI. Also, you've got market controls that link into the law a little bit, like US export guidelines that might stop NVIDIA selling to countries that they don't want them to. The third one, and this is probably one of the most powerful that we're talking about at the moment, is norms okay, and social norms. This is the drivers that make us change our decisions based on the way society and the people around us. And the last area on it is effectively on architecture or code, which is how do we build code or system capabilities to manage and control what's going on? So this could be things like firewalls or IP management, where certain countries block IP addresses for different websites. So there's lots of ways of doing it. Saudi's looking at all of them at the moment. There are a couple of major initiatives that have uh, happened already and are going on. One, Saudi Arabia launched its AI ethics framework almost two years ago. That the framework and sort of policies and checklist is there for anyone in Saudi Arabia to go to and assess from a full checklist whether their code, the AI models they're building, is ethical from a compliance perspective. The next thing we've got, Saudi launched a major program and joint agreement with UNESCO for ICARE, which is the International Center for AI and Ethics. So it's the regional Middle East UNESCO Center, grade two or type two center, for ethics analysis across the entire Middle East region. And finally, Saudi's heavily engaged with G20. If you look at what G20 is trying to do right now with its presidency uh, with Brazil, it's all about responsible AI. They've got papers all over the place trying to bring people together. And where I started on this, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to look at what everyone's doing and see how we can unite a lot of it. So I think everybody's looking at building bigger models. Um, yes, Saudi launched um, a large language model at a sovereign level, a sovereign perspective called Alam. It was launched in May last year. It's the Arabic large language model. It's been developed by the Saudi government. It's been trained on data from the royal court, the Quran, Islamic culture, Islamic history. So it's very heavily ingrained in being culturally and sort of politically correct around the way the Saudi um, organizations work with the Muslim world works and the Arabic language. There are a number of programs on expanding that and driving that into the usage of all government entities, plus into the private sector. One of the most exciting things we've seen in the last couple of weeks coming out of Saudi is Alam being launched into um, Watson X at the IBM conference two weeks ago. So now anyone in the world is able to log into the Watson X AI coding environment, and in the marketplace, they can find the Arabic language model from Saudi Arabia, and they can build off that, develop off that, and do anything they want as an extension in the same way they would of the English models available around the world and all the other tools. We're hearing all the time about artificial general intelligence, uh, and who's gonna get it, and who's gonna have it first. Um, and I think every week we see a different announcement of whether it's 20 years out, 10 years out, or next year, if you're Elon Musk. Um, so AGI is something that's coming. I don't see it being something that we're gonna be looking at properly for five to 10 years. Um, and that's generally the view of a lot of my sort of colleagues and, and friends uh, that advise globally on these areas of work. We're looking into it, but at the moment, artificial intelligence is still limited to where we are. The, gen the concept of AGI and artificial intelligence having human-like ability to reason, we're still a long way away from. The next one, and it, I think this is one we're gonna see a lot more talk of, um, and this is small language models within generative AI. Samsung has now announced its new mobile phone with an inbuilt small language model. So it runs generative AI on the device. It doesn't need to be connected to the internet to do anything. We're gonna see much more um, deployment of the language model capabilities and generative AI capabilities to the edge. They won't need to run on the big centralized servers. We don't need to build 100 billion parameter models. A seven billion parameter model for a specific use case might be just as or significantly more effective than the massive large ones that have cost hundreds of millions to develop around the world.
the other thing which I can guarantee we're going to see in the next three to five years, and it's going to be a continued conversation every week, every month, is regulation. It is the hot topic in AI at the moment, and it's not going to go away. We've got all of the guidelines. We've got all the different organizations around the world pushing them, as we said. We'll hopefully see some conformity coming into it. I think in the next two years, we'll start seeing some penalties being issued uh, to organizations, which will require all of the regulations to be retested again against the judicial system. Uh, and then eventually, hopefully within five years, we'll be at a point where we'll slow down and things will become a little bit simpler and everyone will have a better understanding of how we can or should deploy AI globally.